Well, it's cool because we're already live. TikTok, time to rock. Good evening. We're good time morning. to rock. Good afternoon. You're joking. We're not live. <laughs> we are live. Already ba, ba, black sheep. Oh, oh, we are. Oh, okay. So, oh, anyway, uh, I was gonna sing my "Ba Ba Black Sheep" song, but anyway, if we are live, I can. I don't see us yet. Reserve that for later. Okay. Uh, yo, yo, yo. Wait. Let me put on a. Uh, let me put on some sort of slow mode. Slow I forget mode. to do that. It's weird because it's a situation where. If you put on slow mode, people complain that they're on slow mode. But if you don't put on slow mode, people complain that there's no slow mode. So either way, they complain. And so you have to think, okay, which way makes more sense? Well, it actually makes more sense to have slow mode on if people are actually trying to not be spammed with endless stuff and trying to have a normal conversation. I don't really care about the frequency of of of, of live uh, comments in the comments in the, in the in the live chat, but I just turn it on always just to uh, have power over people and to annoy them. You know? Yeah, so. yeah. That, I mean, that's the main reason for doing anything is you have power over people and you can yeah. you make them feel small when you can crush yeah. them like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Or that is that's the main reason why we do. Yeah, why why I have a channel actually. So <laughs> that's it. That's all. Hey. Yes. Hey, happy Father's Day to everyone out there. Uh, do they have Father's Day around the world, or is that just the U.S. and or U.S. and Canada or something? They don't Anyone have Father's know? around the world. No, they do have. Uh, they do celebrate Father's Day the same I day, mean, like today. I believe so. I've ne I never paid attention to the date, so I don't know. I, mean, I guess. I so it's Father's Day. Bunch of uh, all the uh, all the families over here with me, which means I'm like seven beers deep here. What? This is Bitburger. That's a German beer. Oh, yeah. Möchtest du ein Bitburger trinken, AP? That looks very German. That looks very German. Es ist sehr Deutsch. Is that correct? Is sehr that correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct. <laughs> es ist always, sehr Deutsch. It's always funny because I, I haven't touched German for like almost 20 years, so it's always fun when I get something right. What are we talking it's about? Funny that, it's funny that you remember so much stuff, even some of the really advanced words. Sometimes. As you go back in time, I remember more and more. Like if you ask me something I read last week, I don't remember it, but I will remember commercials from when I was like seven, like oh, just yeah. like completely random commercials for things I was not interested in. But I still like Lee press on nails. They press on in seconds. No glue, no mess. Simply press on Lee super stick tabs. Then press on Lee press on nails. That's all. Easy on, easy <laughs> off. Use them again and again. They just won't break or split. Polish and they're nearly impossible to chip. So press on Lee press on nails in natural <laughs> and glamour length and a variety of sizes for a quick, easy fit. Press on. Like, Why it's all that stupid it? stuff that there's no point. It's like, <laughs> it's filled. My brain is like an orange juice glass and it's filled up with a bunch of stuff from when I was younger. And then I uh, just can't get any more. Oh, hey, check this out. Is there beef between David and Mike? I assume, Chris B. Cream, that you're referring to David Wood and Mike Winger, and you're about to see beef like you've never seen before. Because I would understand why there's beef. Yeah. <laughs> why, why would you think there's beef? Well, because he's a nerd. And nerd! Exactly! I was, I was like, I, if AP says because he's a nerd, AP's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> what what really what really gets me what really gets me is uh if you talk to mike winger in person he uh he talks like this and talks like the biggest nerd you've ever uh, talked to at any point in your entire <laughs> life that's how he talks but he makes his videos and he runs everything through like some auto-tune uh filter or something like that so that he sounds cool when he's talking like that and you listen to him in real life and he's like uh, uh. it's like so anyway it's like someone who I don't know. Just someone who is totally is totally fake. <laughs> why? Why? Why are you making fun of? Oh, oh yeah. So we did want to talk about Mike Winger because he provides a uh, an excellent example. Uh, see, look, people know. People know. Look, the people the people have spoken. Winger, epic nerd. See that? <laughs> You're gonna see because for people who haven't even seen him yet, um, you're gonna be like, whoa. It's like he's like if Napoleon Dynamite became a Christian pastor. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. That's Mike Winger in a in a nutshell. But recently he made a video about reading the Quran and what he what he found after uh, after reading the Quran. But here's what's interesting. 
uh, AP. Matter of fact, let me pull this up. Have you noticed, AP, that lots of people, lots of people, um, lots of Christians who formerly weren't saying much about Islam or are, are, are starting to, to talk about Islam. So look, there's a, there's yeah. a tweet. There's a tweet from Mike Winger. We still have Jeremy Wong pointing out this is Winger's an epic nerd. We know that. We agree. Um, that's not in dispute. That is the one thing we will not dispute in this entire live stream. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so look, people get it. People are people are smart. Um, Venom here points out that Mike is voice catfishing. We could call it voice catfishing. He's pretending to have a cool voice. But it's actually fake. He's catfishing with his Whoa. with a fake voice. That's not cool. All right, so Mike Winger here says, uh, following in the footsteps of Muhammad, who married Aisha when she was a six-year-old girl, someone from Turkey, um, where apparently a six-year-old Muslim girl was married off to a twenty-nine-year-old man, which, by the way, is uh, as disgusting as that is, still actually better um, than what Muhammad did. But this is Mike. Winger. This is Mike Winger, who historically doesn't have a lot to say about Islam, suddenly jumping in on the Muhammad and Aisha issue. AP, do you have any idea why people like inspiring philosophy, Mike Winger, people who, I mean, are, historically aren't even interested really in this stuff, they're interested in other things, are now suddenly jumping in and criticizing Muhammad and Aisha? Isn't that weird? Is that, is it's like there's this sudden, uh, contagious form of Islamophobia going around? Well, I think it might have something to do with the fact that on the internet, a lot of people started jumping up and defending child marriage and Muhammad's child marriage, and that this has suddenly become part of the mainstream. Although for years it was like, no, you're lying, Islamophobes and this and that. I, I feel like it might have something to do with that. But then again, I don't know, maybe it's just Islamophobia. Yeah, and we've said before, these guys are creating, they're creating their own enemies and they don't realize it, right? Like I was at the conference last year, debate con, when inspiring philosophy is sitting there listening to Muslims defending child marriage and he actually seemed like he was about to jump out of his seat in, in a rage. This is inspiring philosophy, right? Uh, he, he's pretty, uh, I don't know, he's, he doesn't seem like the storm the stage type guy but this is how much it was enraging him and the dawa guys they don't seem to understand that even though on some level it's always been normal for them even though they couldn't always say things in, in, in they've always been on some level convinced that at the end of the day it's okay and so yes it might be a little weird to hear it today but uh you know at the end of the day it's different cultures and so on that's what they're thinking and they don't realize people have some very strong feelings about whether grown men should be having sex with little girls and whether they should be defending it and promoting it and beyond all of that especially this uh trend of saying Ah, well, you know, we can defend it in the Bible because the Catholic Encyclopedia says Mary was 12. No, it doesn't. Uh, the Bible says that Isaac married a three-year-old. No, it doesn't. But we can just say that and we can spread it amongst ourselves and never listen to correction. And you've got these people. Uh, I'm going to break it down, AP. If you, if you talk to, to Christians, they, your, your average Christian who's interested in apologetics, evangelism, they've always thought of Muslims as like they're, they're, they're misguided, but they're pursuing the truth and they have the same, they have similar values and so on. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, their, their champions of Dawah are not only defending child marriage, but flat out lying to defend it, misrepresenting sources, misrepresenting the Bible, lying about people in the Bible to defend it. And all of a sudden, it's like a switch is going off and they're thinking, whoa, I, I thought we were on the same page as far as integrity and some basic values. And we knew about polygamy and stuff like that. But I thought we were on the same page as far as like we're all seekers of truth. And we're just, you know, someone's getting something wrong here, but we're all pursuing the, the truth here. And now you guys are just flat out lying. And so it's changing their mindset of thinking, oh, here's, you know, uh, here's a, an otherwise honest person who, who's making some mistakes and we can get together and discuss them to try and clarify some of these issues. Now they're thinking, Whoa, these Dawa guys are evil. These guy, yeah. these Dawa guys are sick and evil and they're defending pedophilia by lying. This is evil, sick stuff. And that's causing them to actually respond. And that is interesting. It is like, I mean, it reminds me of how um, the history of 
of, of Mormonism in America, you know, is uh, is different. It stood it stood for the whole issue of I don't know polygamy, including um, including some really messed up stuff, including I don't know you know pedophilic uh, poly polygamy and all that. But then it um, through controversy, through historical developments, it changes, and the mainstream uh, completely distances itself from that. While there are some fundamentalists who still stick to that and who are then uh, you know, very much uh, shunned, rejected, uh, hated, and all that. But then, with Islam, Islam comes into the in, into the play, and people think um, of Islam like it's it's just like it just has these problematic aspects like Mormonism. But you know, it's probably not uh, you know that big of a deal. It's probably not that mainstream. But then these Muslim apologists come out and they act much worse than the former than than the Mormon fundamentalists have ever acted. And people realize, wait a minute, this is this is worse than anything we have ever seen. <laughs> it is. It <laughs> we is. have to and, deal uh, with it. Yeah, and uh, it, I really think that I think that the the mentality is actually parallel to ISIS. So they're not. To be clear, they're not going out doing the things that ISIS does. But I think that part of the mentality of ISIS was, wait a minute, Islam is totally overpowered by uh, by other nations and so on. Uh, we don't have a we don't have a caliphate. Why is this? What's the explanation? And one possible explanation from an Islamic perspective is that because Muslims have been compromising and not enforcing full Sharia and not doing and, and not standing up for Islam, Allah isn't blessing them to take over the world. So the, the idea of ISIS was we need to completely cleanse everything, enforce strict Sharia, get back to the basics, and then Allah is going to bless us to take over the world. Wow, that really worked very well. Uh, except it didn't at all. But you have a parallel in that if Muslims think, ah, Muslims have, if Muslim da'is think that Muslim leaders and Muslim, the Muslim population have become too westernized and they think, ah, that's not, that's why Allah isn't blessing the community to, to take over the world and dominate and enforce Sharia, then it's, oh, we need to stop running from these things and actually start defending child marriage and sex slaves and all that. That's what they've started doing. And you've got this disturbing number of people who are jumping on board with that, not realizing you're making your next generation of people who are horrified at this religion. And so they're making their own enemies. And it is a uh, it is fun to watch. You so see, notice you got L here. My Mike Winger is my favorite Christian YouTube pastor. Some people do just like nerds, right? They're like, oh, look at this adorable revenge of the nerds type guy uh, sharing stuff. And I mean, I, I understand like, that because people like me. So, yeah, yeah. Here we have an example. Yeah. Um, and you have people here, Jose Gomez, shout out to my wingalings. That's how Mike talks. Hey, shout oh. out to, shout out to all my wingalings out there. Uh, we're tuning in for my broadcast and we're going to talk about the Bible today. Uh, specifically the, the book of Obadiah. We're going to go through the book of Obadiah. We're going to see all the, uh, brilliant life lessons, uh, bibbidi bobbidi, right? That's how, that's how it's said. <laughs> but again, he runs his stuff through the filter. So we'll, we'll, we'll see it in a second. Um, so anyway, should we jump into Anyway, long story short, Mike Winger posted a video recently where he is talking about he's read the Quran and some of the things that jumped out at him from the Quran. I would say that some of the things that, that sort of jumped out at him from the Quran are things that should jump out at everyone or things that it should make everyone go, whoa, wait, wait a minute. What? What is that? Um, uh, matter of fact, you, you just completely uh, attacked and massacred him recently, didn't you? Mike Winger? Didn't you blast him? Oh yeah, recently? no, I, I I attacked him, I humiliated him, I destroyed him, basically, and there's no, there's just no coming back from that. Yeah. This is a this is a good uh, comment, Shepherd's Lamb. Would you agree that a lot of Muslims are misguided people who want to know God, but their leaders are liars and deceitful? I can understand being tricked if that's uh, all you hear for your whole life. Yeah, and that's why I'm careful. That, like a like when Sheikh Yasser Qadi says perfect preservation right down to the letter. Sheikh Yasser Qadi knew that he was lying. It's indisputable. He knew about variants in the Quran. He knew that, so he was lying. When your average Muslim on the street says, well, the Quran's been perfectly preserved right down the letter. It's been, it's a miracle. He's not saying that because he investigated the evidence or even because he knows the truth and he's lying. He's saying it because he heard that from, from people like Sheikh Yasser Qadi and so on. So yeah, we have to distinguish between people who are deliberately lying and people who have been misled by the lies of their leaders. Maybe they mean perfect uh, perversion. I don't know. Yeah, then, then it would be right. 
the Quran <laughs> has been perfectly perverted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, hey, check this out. Oh, hey, another one from Shepherd's Lamb. D. Wood is my favorite apologist because I love ex-cons for Jesus. So that's like the only requirement. I can be like the worst apologist in the world, but as long as I'm an ex-con, Shepherd's Lamb be cool. Uh, with, uh, no squares allowed. See, you got this. That is the correct idea. Uh, my dad was a murderer who found Jesus. We can all be saved. God bless. Unless you're, unless you're uh, an atheist, in which it doesn't matter what we do because we're all just worm food anyway. Exactly. Uh, I would say uh, my, my favorite apologist is a Christian apologist would be uh, David, just for the mere fact that he agrees with me on a lot of things. We do agree on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Other than that, no. Like even, even uh, matter of fact, recently we made a video. You made a recent video and I made a video. We didn't collaborate at all. We just made a video on the same topic, but we addressed almost identical points. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was it was like that. Uh, it was like that with Nabil. We'd be in it. We, me and Nabil would be in a class, and it was like uh, it was organic chemistry. There were like eighty or ninety students in the class, and normally we'd sit in back because we we joke around. For somehow somehow we ended up in front of the organic chemistry class. And I remember I don't even remember what she said, but we had a professor. And she she said something, and I had to. I didn't want to crack crack up laughing because I'm in the front of the class, so I kind of went like this. Right. I thought something she said something was hilarious. And I look over at Nabil and Nabil's like suppressing his laugh. He's and I turn <laughs> around and look and no one in the class is even smiling. And I was like, how are we like, well, how do we have the exact same sense of humor? We both saw something that we thought was hilarious and no one else even thought it was remotely. Anyway, people, people, uh, people uh, with common. That, that, uh, that's, that's magic. All right. So should we should we watch some of Mike Winger? Keep in mind, guys, he is catfishing with the voice here. He has a. Much more ridiculous voice. Let's destroy Mike Winger. All right. So we're going to be agreeing with Mike Winger, but he doesn't get a free pass for being a nerd just because we're watching him. All right. So let's check this out. So I think here's good advice for evangelizing anybody who's committed to a religious belief system is to learn about their belief system so that you can under you can understand them, they can understand you, but also you could leverage the 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 things that they hold to. In, in ways that lead them to Jesus Christ. And so some examples could be that in, in Islam, Jesus is considered a prophet. So this is different. Hold, hold up. Just, I mean, <laughs> what kind of dark lights up his background with a blue background to make it look cooler? <laughs> I mean, look at him. You see him lighting up his back. Hold up. Hold up. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> I've, got, I've got one of those. Hang on, I want to be, I want to be cool like Mike Winger. Hold up. <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go, everyone. Hey, check it out. Hang on, hang on. Does that even work? Can you see the? You can't even see the blue on this, man. Oh yeah, you, we can. We can. It is noticeable. Can? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. It is a terrible idea to have your background blue. It's just, <laughs> it's, just it's just straight dork blue. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. ridiculous. All right, so all right, we all got uh, I got the blue going like Mike Wigger, and now I can be super cool. All right, so yeah. that'll that'll help any of his fans who come over here. They'll they'll feel like they're at, they're at home. All right, so here we go. Oh, so let me back up a little bit. So what he was saying is knowing something about someone else's religion can help you if you're talking to that person because then you'll know what you're talking about so we back up slightly here in islam jesus is considered a prophet so this is different than in in some other religions where jesus would be considered like a, a, a threat right jesus is a prophet in islam and so there's like an open door there's like let me talk about jesus he, you say he's a prophet let's look at his words you can study what the quran says about the bible and you can use this as a bridge to understanding the Bible more, helping them understand the Bible more, like helping them see the value of the scriptures. But Muslims are also taught that the Bible is very corrupt. Okay, so it's not necessarily in the Quran, right? But they're taught, they have to teach this. They have to be taught that the Bible is corrupt because the Bible totally refutes, as it stands, refutes Islam in a lot of different ways. Um, Islam teaches that, that Jesus was never even put on the cross. Okay, so a couple of things here before he moves on to the crucifixion. Um, what's he on about there, AP, with, uh, with, uh, hey, if you know what the Quran says about the Bible, that can actually be relevant for discussion. Any idea what he's thinking about there? Um, I have no idea. Yeah, what, 
What in the world? What in the world is this dude talking about? Um, I, so, I have no idea. I, I don't know why anyone would bring that up even. Yeah. yeah so uh, it's something we've been through roughly a hundred trillion times, and we've challenged we've challenged our Muslim friends on repeatedly, and we've both. I mean, we we were we've both been so hardcore on this particular point that we've told Muslims if they can show us where where the Quran says that the gospel has been corrupted that we will convert to Islam if they can show us. That's how confident we are that the Quran never, ever says any such thing. I made a video where I went through every single verse in the Quran that ref that even mentions the gospel. And all it ever does is affirm the inspiration, preservation, authority. So I, I, I think that's the kind of point Mike Winger is making, that if you know that, then that's actually pretty helpful if you get into a discussion with a Muslim, uh, especially since, as he points out, they've been trained to uh, say that the the Bible's been corrupted, and so if you actually know something about the religion, that that can come in handy. Mm -hmm. And then looks like he's going into the crucifixion. Back up slightly, just so we don't. Uh... Do you hear his voice? By the way, it sounds completely different from what from the way he sounds yeah. in person. Yeah. yeah, like there's none of that. Uh, 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 everyone, hey, uh, I love everybody. Uh, Mike Winger, uh, Mike Winger. <laughs> Here we go. ways um islam teaches Look at, that listen to all that Jesus bass in his was, voice guys what program do you use to do that how do you go from that all right anyway did you notice by the way how i how i um how you try to give me the word on, on what he's talking about and then i completely uh like a genius deflect it and gave it back to you instead yeah and then, and then people and then people will complain why is david talking so much blah, blah, blah. This is a this is a genius move on my part, which I can uh, teach on my channel. If you uh, only subscribe and pay fifty dollars a month, I can teach you this and also teach you uh, a PhD program. Uh, which yeah yeah yeah, this is this is nowadays fashion. So you could be a real a real top Y. I would top, I would be a top yeah, YouTuber. Yeah. yeah, top something. Yeah. Top YouTuber. Top YouTuber. Top YouTuber. <laughs> Uh, top that's... youtuber yeah go ahead <laughs> look someone's saying just from that just from just from listening to mike winger for for one minute some jose gomez says nerd overload <laughs> that is correct <laughs> that's exactly terrible, terrible. that is exactly uh terrible, how people terrible. react um wait a second we've got someone here humble humbly rise says uh ap i'm just here for the daily vocabulary word is humbly rise referring to you using the word salvific that is very salvific, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't know. I, you know what? What's funny? Um, I have a lot of such words on my mind, but that word salvific is not actually a word that I encountered during any studies. It is actually something that I encountered while I was playing a game. <laughs> and I, wait, and I thought, wait, wait. So you're playing Call of Duty, and he's like, "Ah, let's kill these salvific." <laughs> No, no, it, it was it was a it was a it was a strategy game, like a history game, was a game that I love a lot, which is called which is uh, it's called Europa Universalis. And um, as I was playing that, I I I I read this salvific, and I'm like, wait, salvific? I've never heard of this word. And then I thought, wow, I was always looking for an adjective for that, and there is one, and I've never thought about that, I've never encountered it, and then and then I I, I actually used it. So yeah, I have to say it wasn't. It wasn't through diligent studying that I actually acquired that word. It was video games. <laughs> well, and then what's cool about learning the new word is then you can sound super smart, right? You can just yeah. pull that out of your pocket like ultra crepidarian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I completely broke the whole thing, though. Now people are not impressed anymore, but yeah, whatever. I don't care anymore. Never even put on the cross. He wasn't crucified. He didn't die. Now you could say, hey, let's look at historians. Um, historians actually would say that Jesus' death by crucifixion under Romans like Pontius Pilate, it is one of the most certain facts of history. Think about that. Not only does the Bible say it happened that way, it seems to be one of the most certain facts of history. And Muhammad, who came over 400 years later, he wrote down it didn't happen. Did he say over 400 years later? I mean, he's technically correct because Muhammad did come over 400 years later. But I mean, like we're over 400 years later. It's like, okay, so Jesus came. And then over 400 years later, David and AP are doing a show. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the 600. Yeah. 
600 something. Why would I believe that? Why would I believe that? Because that same author says that the New Testament here is is God's word. So they go, oh, it's been corrupted, but they can't actually point to the, this is where it gets beyond probably a normal 15 year old at least. You know, they can't actually point to the textual corruption in the actual documents we have that represent our New Testament. They can't point to the corruption. There's there's no textual critic I've ever heard of on the planet who would suggest that the New Testament, there, there was ever a version of the New Testament that didn't have the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection. Uh, these are these are not debatable things as far as textual corruption is concerned. The only, other, See, isn't he it, adorable? It, <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I know. He's, he has this uh, interesting, likable, dorky... Uh, <laughs> Attitude and, and, like, and all that. You know, as we can see from all the commentaries that I read, I mean, come on, I mean, ah, they gotta believe this. It's cool, but okay. th that's what makes it likable. If I was, if I was religious and I was looking for people to listen to, like, I, I would, I would like the way this guy uh, acts and you know appeals to his audience. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of nice. But I want to say he actually is addressing a very, uh, very. very good thing to to tell people about that whole narrative that the Bible has been corrupted, because that, that is an interesting detail that should be brought up in debates and with in encounters with Muslims to, okay, you, you are saying the Bible is corrupt, you're saying uh, the scripture has been corrupted, but you know, can you exactly tell me when that happened, how it happened? Can you actually, can you point out how this corruption took place? What exactly is corrupted based on what you conclude that it is corrupted? And to go more into the details, because everybody can say, you know, there is corruption because it disagrees with your scripture. But when you go into the details, it just does not make sense. You have the scripture in Muhammad's time. Up until that time, the Christians were following a religion and had their book. And you, you have to assume that uh, from from that time on, so after Muhammad's time, somehow the corruption happened, or just before his time, the corruption happened. And then you have to explain how exactly it happened, how exactly people can come together and cause such a huge corruption that the that they remove all the truth and include so much falsehood into all of their narratives. It is just ridiculous. Muslims themselves cannot explain what they are arguing here. Yeah, he is, uh, as nerdy as he is, he is hitting all of the issues he's doing it in kind of rapid fashion that he could you could of course unpack all of these issues a lot more but i mean think about that so the quran at least according to the dominant position we've heard from uh, people like uh, khalil uh, uh andani and so on who uh, take the minority position which has always been a minority position that the quran is actually saying something different there uh but but the the dominant position has been to deny that Jesus was crucified or killed. And the Bible, of course, says that he was crucified and killed. And so you've got two competing claims. And so you could look to history, he points out, right? You could look to history. And history is going to come down massively on the side of the Christian claim. But, I mean, it's not just the Christian claim. Pretty much everyone except Muslims and certain uh, Gnostics and, and Docetists uh, have always have always held to that position, um, and scholars across the board they agree that Jesus was crucified. They treat it as one of the best established facts of history. So the, there, the the historical evidence is massively on one side, and so what are you going to say? You're going to say corruption, and he points out you can't even say you can't legitimately say that because that's not what the Quran says. But a Muslim is going to say that. But even then, when they talk about corruption of the Bible, what like if they heard Bart Ehrman or something like that talk about textual variants, you're you're not dealing. There's no scenario of textual variance that gets you to a Jesus who didn't die by crucifixion. In fact, we've asked him about we've asked him about that. There is no guys. Muslims still don't seem to understand when you're talking about textual variants. You're talking about like usually like spelling differences and things like that. You're not getting to any sort of major doctrine shift. And so you go anywhere in the manuscripts, Jesus died by crucifixion. So the, the idea that things have been corrupted, that doesn't work. So he's pointing out there's actually no way to get to this view. And he points out that it's Muhammad's coming uh, centuries later. So it's like, wait, you've got history on this side. You can't say corruption. You can't even say corruption according to your book. What, do you, what have you got to go on? You've got Muhammad saying something centuries later and obviously having no clue what he's talking about. Why would you go with that? And so he seems to be right on the money as far as that. So absolutely, that's good. <laughs> Is he his bookshelves in the background? What a dork, man. 
<laughs> and before someone blurts out, but David, you have bookshelves too. Yeah, mine are handmade bookshelves. He got those straight from Ikea. Look at that. Those are not, those are, <laughs> those are store-bought bookshelves. It's not manly, guys. It's not manly. Um, can't work, can't, can't work with his hands. Went and bought some, uh, bought some bookshelves from Ikea. Probably had someone else assemble. Are those, G are those gummy bears or jelly beans on his desk? There's a giant, there's a giant jar of gummy bears on his desk beside a light bulb that's doing nothing except laying up a forty dollar guitar from Walmart. <laughs> How, how does this guy have people watching? <laughs> like how? Oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, just just picking out uh, the random thing and just picking on him for sport. No, it's just, oh it's well, uh, well, he certainly makes it easy. <laughs> well, he, cer he certainly makes it easy. Um, Gray's here says, uh, "Wait, so at what point in history did Muslims start saying the Bible got corrupted?" One claim is. One claim is that it was when liberal higher criticism took off. No, they started saying it before that. They started saying it much earlier than that. But yes, if you go to the earliest, uh, the earliest level, uh, your earliest, um, uh, your, your earliest commentators on what they thought. Uh, at first, they thought that people, Christians and Jews, were corrupting the Bible with their speech. That was the earliest view. It was. The most people can't read, and so the people who can read are misrepresenting what the Bible says to people who can't read. And so Christian preachers and Jewish preachers are misrepresenting the text. Then you ended up with a mixture because you eventually started getting to people who did know what was in the Bible and did and knew that it didn't line up with the Quran. And then eventually you got to the position where it has to be, the Bible has to be corrupted because it, 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 they eventually know that the Quran does not line up with the Bible on basic doctrines. And so you see this evolution of views. Um, all right, should we jump? I, th I think there was um, one one popular uh, one popular view is that who was that? It, 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 I think it was Ibn Hazm in the in the during the Andalusian period. He was the one. Uh, he he was a very he was a very very hardcore scholar. But he was the one who first explicitly wrote down and pointed out that the Bible in its original form has been had been lost and that it's that the current form had been you know completely corrupted or or something like that and yeah i i believe it was it was him i can briefly check that but but yeah that's, and uh, that's one view. and so it's a it's just this interesting situation where you've got an entire pop almost an entire population who thinks that uh that the Quran, it's not just that they think the Bible's been corrupted, they think the Quran says that the Bible's been corrupted. And uh, that's just interesting. And it's just, it's just, it's it's right up there with the myth of perfect preservation and the myth of scientific miracles. It's just their leaders have been saying something all these years, and people think that they're, uh, that they're being told the truth by their leaders when they're just not. I mean, I mean, imagine when Ali Dawa comes out and says, yeah, okay, the argument been debunked. Okay, then all the people who are putting that forward shame on them but that was you know ahmed didad and zakar and Ike and, and and endless piles of dais spouting that complete nonsense uh they were also saying perfect preservation right down to the letter now they admit that's a lie um it's so wait the guys the guys who are telling you that the quran says the bible's been corrupted those are the same guys who've been lying to you about everyone else and you're going to trust them right this is I, he, yeah, yeah. So, so here, here is the whole uh, information about about that that claim again. It was, uh, it was indeed Ibn Hazm. Ibn Hazm was a a scholar from the from the tenth century and eleventh century in today's Spain, so uh, Andalusia. And he he's very he was very very uh, lit literalist. He was from the the Ahiri school, which today doesn't really exist anymore. Um, of, of people who took everything completely literal and and, and had no further speculation on them in the scripture and had a very literalist application of law as well but he was the one who I th who, who as it is uh currently thought um for the first time r um explicitly wrote that the bible as it was revealed in its original form had been lost that it simply just does not exist anymore and that the current bible is a corruption which can not be relied upon and that is you know 10th century and 11th century 11th century actually that's when he 
was doing his, his work. That is quite a while after the emergence of Islam. And at that time, mo most people didn't even really adopt that view. Uh, that became mainstream later on. He was also the one who argued that those who believe that Jesus has been crucified are outright disbelievers. They are Kafir and, and things like that. So um, that, that is a development that in, uh, out of necessity arose over time. Yeah, and it, and it had to, and because notice if your if your prophet says, uh, if your prophet affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of a book that completely contradicts his own book on basic doctrines, you've put people in a very difficult spot here because um, if you affirm a book that completely contradicts your own book, you just destroyed your own book because. If you, if you go with the book that you're affirming, then it contradicts your book, so your book has been destroyed. Uh, or if you conclude that you shouldn't trust the book that you're affirming, well, then you're in trouble because you affirmed the book. Either way, you're in trouble for affirming a book that you contradict. And so the only alternative, so you either say, okay, now I have to reject the Quran, in which case you get your head chopped off, or you have to say, oh, well, it must have been corrupted anyway, even though that's the exact opposite of what the Bible, I mean, of what the Quran says. So it's just uh, it's an awkward position that they've been put in by their prophet. But guys, your your prophet has put you in this position, not us. All right. I would actually encourage you to do, uh, I'll add to this, is actually to read the Quran. Um, I know some of you guys are like, don't tell her read the Quran. But. <clears throat> oh, hang on, hang on. That's interesting. What are your thoughts on this, AP? Because uh, I'll, I'll give you, people ask me all the time, and it's normally Christians who are asking for like evangelistic purposes, which is what Mike's talking about. And I can, I can see it. I can see you answering in, in either way, because I would agree with Mike. It helps if you know the Quran. But it all, it's always seemed to me like people who decide, hey, I'm going to read the Quran to learn about Islam, to do evangelism, they like 99% of them give up because it's so hard to read the Quran and they give up and they stop. So I normally tell them, don't do that. Read some articles or books or, or read topically, pick a topic you're interested in, go to the index of the Quran, find all the passages about that topic, then read those. But just read, just starting off at the beginning of the Quran and reading it through, people give up. With that said, if someone, if someone says, no, 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 if I read it, I'm actually going to stick to it. I would say, oh, of course, read the Quran then. So me, I'm just thinking in practical sense, in a practical sense, I want people to familiarize themselves with Islam so that they know what they're talking about. It's just, uh, just starting out, jumping into the Quran, they tend to give up. So don't start that way. Read that later. Uh, but he's, he's, he's talking to people and saying, yeah, go ahead and read it, which again, if they're going to stick with it, I would agree with what, what are your, what are your thoughts? What, cause do, do people ask you if they should read the Quran? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I usually say that, um, I mean, go ahead and read it. I mean, I like to give people a, a rundown, a, a quick breakdown of what Islam is and, uh, you know, what the Quran is all about and how it is. But I, I always tell people to just go, pick it up and start reading specifically because I know that most of them will uh, immediately <laughs> be, become aware of how terrible it is, even to even, even in the in, that's in a good point. Structure. That's a good point. That's a good yeah. point. Right. So. And, so in other words, so on, they will not even they will not even uh, continue reading because it is so bad. And, yeah. So on my view, people would give up. But in that process, they would find out how bad it is. So I guess that is yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> we, that's why. We, we can even combine this. Someone could say, hey, David, uh, I'm interested in evangelism to Muslims. Should I read the Quran? I, I should say yes. And then when you inevitably give up, you will understand a good response to their objection that the Quran is this masterpiece of literature and so on. So that when, when a Muslim eventually says, ah, oh, you should read the Quran, you can say, I tried, but that was, my goodness, that was the worst book I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Exactly. All right, exactly. you have a you have a request here. Uh, hi, I just want to hear Ali Dawa voice impression from both of you. Both of us. So go, you go ahead first. Also, what we can see is that all the arguments that we've been using for all of these years <laughs> has all been has all been a bunch of lies. But you should still be Muslim, yeah. You should still be Muslim because if not, then listen, bloke, we gonna chop your heads off, yeah. <laughs> Dal, Ali, yeah. that one in a nutshell. I can't. I can't do it right now. I need more. I need more energy and more, <laughs> more meditation, more dedication, and I have to do. You need more about... bit beer. <laughs> no yeah. bit burger. You need more bit burger. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> Probably. Probably. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, let's see what else. Pastor Mike Winger. Look at this guy. Why is it so dark? Her purple shirt is nerd Continue glasses. I'll, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Continue yeah, talking. Yeah, yeah we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and watch some more Mike Winger, and I'll I'll fill in. I'll Here's fill in why. There's nothing in the Quran that's going to convince you to be Muslim. Okay, it's not that kind of book. Um, it's very difficult to read. It's organized oddly. So the so the opening chapters of the Quran are the longest ones, and it's for the most part the book is organized longest chapter to shortest. Imagine if you did this with like the with the books of the Bible. I'm going to organize them longest book to shortest book. You know, and you've got like Jude and like Obadiah. You know, you've got like these short books at the end, and then you have these really long. But then it would be so disjointed. Well. The Quran's like that, except the Quran's not even books, it's just chapters. So the chapters are like in different chronological orders. It's very difficult to figure out what's going on. He, he's, he, he, <laughs> I actually want to go back. He's making a very important point. He, it's funny how this is a short video, but he is zeroing in on all of the most important uh, details. So he's, he's warning people. He's, he's saying, hey, you should read the Quran. But he's saying, he's pointing out that it's, the organization is ridiculous. When they decided how yeah. to organize it, they just say, okay, we'll put the longest chapter first and then the next longest and stuff all the way up. I mean, apart from Fatiha at the beginning, but uh, we'll just arrange it from longest to shortest. But now it's all massively out of order. But he compares that, like, what if you did that with the Bible? What if you did that with the books of the Bible? Um, the, the, <laughs> most, the most chapters is like book of Psalms. I think as far as word count, I think Jeremiah is the longest if you just count words. So notice you'd like start off the Bible with, maybe some little prayer or something like that. And then you have like Jeremiah and then you go Psalms. And it's like, it would be, you'd be like, what are you doing? It'd be even worse if you did it by like chapter. So you found like the longest chapter in the Bible and you started off with that. And then you used to go with the next one. It'd be like, like who does this? But that's, that's the Quran. I imagine just writing a book. Um, you, you write a book, you have a bunch of uh, different thoughts, you write chapter for chapter for chapter, and then you're like, okay, now I have this, I have all of this st stuff together, but what should I do? In, in what order should I put it? And then you're like, oh, I think I know, I will just go from from long to short. And then you just, you just do that. And it's completely, there is, there is no reason for that at all. There is no flow, no sense to that, nothing at all. But that's just how it goes. It, it's, it's <laughs> and it's dumb because you'd have been, you'd have probably been a little better off reversing that and starting off with the shorter chapter. Yes, because the, the, yes, shorter, exactly. the shorter chapters tended to, it's not, it's not perfect, but they tended to be earlier than the, than the longer chapter. So it's just, yeah, I mean, there are lots of dumb ways to arrange stuff, but if you've got a book that depends on abrogation, in other words, later chapters cancel earlier chapters or, or a, a command can be canceled by a a later command, it may, chronology is pretty darn important. And then, so to put that as your fundamental principle and then put the chapters completely out of order, you're, you're, you're begging for trouble and, and you, you're in, you're making it so that you have to go outside the Quran to even understand it, to even understand what, in other words, if you were on a desert Island and you had a copy of the Quran, that's all you had, you would not know how to be a, a proper Muslim. You wouldn't know because you can't. That, that's a funny thing. Um, as a Muslim, this is what you understand from a scripture. You know, you have you have the Quran, you have that structure. And uh, when you switch from the Quran, which is completely all over the place, jumping from topic to topic, repetitions all over again, uh, no chronology, nothing at all. You then jump to to the Bible and you start reading that from the beginning. It suddenly reads like an actual book where it's, uh, it starts from the beginning, it goes through, uh, I don't know, it, it, I mean, there is a structure to it, right? It suddenly makes sense. It suddenly is an actual book. It's, it's, it's quite interesting that people think those two uh, scriptures are from the same source. Can you see his fingernail? <laughs> He's got one. It's his middle <laughs> finger. It's right. It's right here. He's got his middle finger right here. <laughs> but he's got, <laughs> he's got I, I, see, I see it now. Yeah, I see it now. <laughs> what, 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 what kind of pastor is this? He's got one painted finger. Uh, Maybe it's an injury. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, yeah. From what? Building his bookshelves? <laughs> All right. Let's see what else he's got here. But. As you read it, it will be obvious to you that it's a very human 
human. Yeah, he is. Let me let me back this up because he was uh, he was crushing it. He's saying, hey, you know, people might think, why are you telling people to read the uh, read the Quran here? Uh, you're going to find out that it's a a pure, a purely human book with this uh, silly organization. Let me back. It's not even books. It's just chapters. So the chapters are like in different chronological orders. It's very difficult to figure out what's going on. But as you read it, it will be obvious to you that it's a very human, human book. So there's a, there's a part in there where Muhammad writes, as you're reading the Quran, you'll see it. Muhammad writes that, um, oh yeah, you guys asking, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, my finger, um, I smashed it. That's all. I smashed it. You should have seen it like a week ago. It was like all blue. <laughs> the whole finger was. So I smashed it here. I got a little bit of a blood blister here. There you go. See? Uh, Wait. See? Wait. If he gets his shells from Ikea, how's he smashing his finger? Don't act like you're doing a, you're doing a work, real man's work here. You know what I mean? <laughs> like what? Hang on. Hang on. Hold up. <laughs> oh, hang on. Because notice he doesn't say what happened. He just says he smashed it, right? But how, how's this guy? How's this like king of the nerds <laughs> going to smash his finger? Like, what's he doing? So it's like, hey, AP, AP, you, you, be, you be you. I'll be, I'll be Mike, Mike Winger. You asked me what, what happened to my finger. Okay. I'll show you your finger first. Okay. Huh? You got to make it, you got to make it real. Show your finger first. Okay. <laughs> oh, what, what, what happened to your finger, David? Oh, well, uh, very thoughtful of you to ask, neighbor, because as you know, caring and sharing, you're not going to believe this, but uh, I went ahead and got my new copy of the ESV study Bible, and boy, is this thing a monster. But I've already, you know, I've had three copies of this before, but I burned through them all. You know how that goes. Anyway, I got so excited when my new leather-bound ESV study Bible came in, that I just immediately started reading. And since it's in, since it is in chronological order, I just started reading and reading, and then I got to the end, and I go, whoo, and I, I slammed this big old book right on my finger, and look what happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy wingalings, wingalings. Um, anyway that, I wonder if he's going to watch us and cry I, don't know. I hope he he's probably, he's probably going to send me a, why, uh, why are you messing with me uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I'm not going to send I was going to send you some gummy bears but no more no more <laughs> oh boy I can't believe AP's making fun of this Poor innocent pastor. Terrible. All right. <laughs> Let's Terrible. see what so we got Mike talking about smashing his finger while reading a giant book. <laughs> All right, here we go. No big deal. I'm super manly, so I didn't even feel it. Okay, so what was I saying? In the Quran, um, you have this interesting <laughs> stuff where like Muhammad says, God told me to tell you that when you come over to my house and you have dinner with me, you can't stay and ask questions about God. You have to go home because I'm tired. I didn't say it. God told me to tell you that. I kid you not. That is in the Quran. <laughs> like this is very obviously was written. You know, Muhammad's like, these people are bugging me, asking me all these questions. I don't necessarily know the answers to. I have a revelation. This is exactly how Joseph Smith did it, right? Joseph Smith is the same way. He's like, oh, I have a revelation. Uh, God wants your wife to become my wife. Oh. <laughs> and so they put their desires in God's mouth. Muhammad wanted at one point in history, Muhammad wanted to marry a girl. Okay, so he's on. So he's on to a. Uh, he, he's about to move on to a different issue, but uh, he is uh, he is hitting the nail on the head here of uh, of uh, some of the issues. So uh, that's an issue we bring up quite a bit. AP that uh, that funny verse in the Quran. That is also. Um... What's very funny is when I was a when I was a Muslim and when I was very devout and I encountered this one guy who uh, said that he doesn't believe in God at all and I was very surprised it's Turkey that it's, it's, it's it, it was hard also in my environment to actually encounter such people and um, I was asking him why he doesn't believe and uh, you know, why why he rejects the whole you know why he rejects Islam, which is obviously true. And, and he mockingly said to me, he said, have you read the Quran? I said, uh, yes. He said, well, there is, there is a verse in which, you know, in which, in which Muhammad, in which Allah tells people that they shouldn't stay too long when they come to visit Muhammad because it bothers him. 
does that sound to you like it's uh, it's it's Allah, or does it sound like it's a human talking? And the funny thing is, I read the Quran and I I I came across that verse when I was a believer, and I didn't even think about it. I didn't even I didn't even you know stop and and think about how ridiculous it actually sounds. When I read it, it just seemed completely okay. Like, oh, it's it's an interesting point about ethics, you know, uh, mm -hmm. but, or, or about, about about the etiquette of visiting or visiting the prophet. Only later, when it was mockingly pointed out, did I did I uh, on my way home think, wait a minute, cause that's kind of weird, isn't it? So <laughs> it's it's very weird. Yeah. yeah, it. But it, it's interesting. It is something. If you were just reading it and not focusing, you'd just be reading Surah Thirty Three, and you read this. Okay, you know, stop being jerks and hanging out at Muhammad's house all the time when he's trying to, you know, bang all his uh, all his uh, wives and so on. Uh, matter of fact, let's go ahead and take a look for people who sense. we we've talked about this a bunch of times, but for people for whom this is new, uh, here you go. So this is Surah 33, verse 53. Um, you can go with any translation you want here, but um, uh, we'll go with Haleli Khan. Let's see. Oh, you who believe. So keep in mind, everyone. People are heading over to Muhammad's house and they come over to Muhammad's house because they, they think it'd be great to hang out with Muhammad. And so he says, oh, okay, come on over for dinner. But then, you know, he's the prophet. So now's your chance to ask him all kinds of questions. You can say, ah, hey, Muhammad, what about this? What about this? Where does the sun set? You can ask him all these questions and get the answers. Meanwhile, Muhammad wants to be, you know, banging all his wives and his child bride and his sex slave and stuff like that. So he's getting annoyed. <laughs> but he won't say he won't say anything. He just sits there and puts up with it. Yes, I'll answer all your questions. Uh, the sun sets in a muddy pool. We all know that. Come on. And uh, so he breaks it down for them. <laughs> But then one day he comes out and he says, gather around, gather around Muslims, because I have received a revelation. And it's, oh, you who believe, enter not the prophet's houses, except when leave is given to you for a meal. And then not so early as to wait for its preparation. In other words, don't show up early and be chatting, right? Show up when it's right when you're ready to eat. But when you are invited, enter. So when you're invited, enter. So like when, when the meal is supposed to start, then you jump in. <coughs> Uh, and when you have taken your meal, disperse, right? So once you've eaten, <laughs> notice when you finish, when you finish your food, get out of here <laughs> without <laughs> specifically says without sitting for a talk, <laughs> do not sit around talking to Muhammad. Verily such behavior annoys the prophet and he is shy of asking you to go, but Allah is not shy of telling you the truth. And when you ask his wives for anything you want, ask them from behind the screen. That is pure for your hearts and for theirs. And it is not right for you that you should annoy Allah's messenger, nor that you should ever marry his wives after him, after his death. Verily with Allah, that shall be an enormity. Because guys were saying, hey, don't worry uh, if you die because you're old um, and you're, you know, you're all poisoned up and stuff. But uh, don't worry, we'll take care of Aisha after you. I'm going to marry her. So don't worry about <laughs> who's going to take care of Aisha. And there, there you have... There you have uh, the response from Allah, all this stuff that's been annoying Muhammad, but he's too shy to say any of this. He steps out one day and says, here's a revelation. Oh, Allah is going to name all the stuff that's annoying me. I wasn't going to say anything, but Allah is not shy like me. So here's the revelation from Allah. Now you better obey him because that's Allah. And it's just. Uh, this, this verse is actually, um, to me, it is. It is one of the good evidences that that Muhammad is real and that Muhammad is actually the guy behind the Quran who, you know, who who who, who recited to his followers this stuff and people then came together and wrote it down. Because I feel like this is just such a clear sign of a human origin, of a human making this stuff up and telling people then about it. I mean, this is probably what 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 a lot of people would do if they uh, if if they if they tricked people into believing that they are actually speaking on behalf of Allah and that they are receiving revelations all the time, I guess you could make use of it. It's it's a little bit risky, right? You, you, because you would probably risk raising suspicions because it's kind of strange that that Allah would interfere and uh, and make a revelation just for your convenience about how your guests shouldn't bother you too much. But he did it, and it's a very it's a very human origin verse. I think it's quite obvious. Yeah, this is um, this whole chapter. You could make 
an entire three hour video just on problems with Surah 33. Sur, yeah. I mean, Surah 3350, that's the verse where Allah says, hey, Muhammad, even though everyone else is limited to four wives, you get more. You get as many as you want. All right. A little bit suspicious there. This is, and I, Mike's about to go here, but he points out Surah 33, verse 53. That's this one. Then uh, Surah 33, uh, 37, that's the one with Zainab. And so that's mm -hmm. another big issue. And then he's going to point out that uh, in order to justify his relationship with Zainab, he had to abolish adoption. That's also in Surah 33. You have all of these passages. And by the way, originally, this is where the verses of breastfeeding adults were that were uh, eaten by Aisha's sheep. And so it's like, and this is this is the chapter that Ubay ibn Kaab said originally was as long as Surah 2, the longest chapter of the Quran. It's almost 300 verses. Today, there are 73 verses in it. Why? Aisha had the only copy and a sheep ate it. And so they lost over 200 verses from this chapter. So it's important. To, this is the main chapter people go to when they, they, they point to things that just tip them off. Like, this is obviously a man coming up with this stuff. Yeah. Obviously. This is where they go. What's amazing is that over 200 of the worst verses were taken out of this because, I mean, it's kind of obvious what happened with, with Muhammad and Aisha. I mean, the verse of the verses of breastfeeding adults, right, where, where, where oh, uh, your wife has to be around a grown man and you're worried about them committing adultery. No problem. Have her breastfeed the guy 10 times. That'll that'll so that'll solve any sexual tension between them. Then they won't be attracted to each other once she's put her her breast in his mouth repeatedly and he's sucked on them. <laughs> this, is, this is the creator of the universe supposedly revealing this. Uh, this I mean, solution. if this if this if this surah if this chapter was revealed um, actually at the same time, most of it, then this is just this looks like a time where Muhammad was something was really going wrong in Muhammad's head. This is also, I mean, that event uh, that we just talked about three three fifty three that that happens. So when uh, when Allah says, "Don't sit too long in Muhammad's house," that is. Um, the night or the day that Muhammad gets married to to, to Zainab, and that's when people come over and sit there too long. So his his uh, his adopted son's wife, when he gets married to her, and then people come over to 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 feast and they stay too long, and he gets mad about it and makes this revelation. And then in the same chapter, as you pointed out, there is again the whole issue where it goes deeper into the Zainab problem and 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 all that. So it's it's maybe. Muhammad's mental health was not really very much in order when these verses, when this chapter was being revealed, or he was just having too much fun. I don't know. That's what it's, I mean, it seems like a period in history where he's just like, I can get anything I want. Like, I, I mean, if you ask me to come down on a side, I, I believe that Muhammad actually thought that he was a prophet. So I don't believe he was just like, ah, I'm going to come out and dupe everyone and trick everyone. So I, I think he was... Same. He really Same. thought he was receiving revelations, but Same. it's it's this chapter is the one where you go. I don't know. I mean, this seems it seems like too. I mean, it kind of seems like too much. So what you'd have to say if you wanted to stick with that, you'd have to say that. I mean, his desires were just massively influencing his revelations. Like anything he want, any perverted thing he wanted, he's just he really thinks Allah's giving him revelations to justify anything, uh, anything that he wants. Yeah, I, that's the thing. Um, I would not. I mean, it, it seems very unlikely to me that Muhammad was actually, um, you know, the, this this deceitful guy who, like an evil genius, kind of created this whole fake idea that he is a prophet, and then he was just, you know, uh, creating these these revelations and fooling everybody. I, I think that is very hard for me to believe. Uh, it's it's very hard to maintain something like that. And I think he has to be really a, a genius and people have to be extremely dumb around him for that, for him to pull that off for so long. So I, I think it is much more likely. I, I also think it's very unlikely for humans to actually be that way. I think uh, in Muhammad's case, he did have mental problems and he genuinely believed that he's receiving revelations. But um, he also began fooling himself and, you know, getting, I don't know, uh, believing his own desires to be of divine origin to make up things in his head for his own desires and then to somehow uh you know 
either completely believe that they come from Allah or somehow deep inside know that he's making it up, but he can't acknowledge it because he's already so far in it. But yeah, I, I agree entirely that uh, he probably genuinely thought he was a prophet of Allah. Yeah, and it's um, <clears throat> here you have no man gets turned on sucking women's breasts, so says Allah. <laughs> and notice the, the reverse would have to be true as well, that women aren't going to get turned on by this uh, uh, young stud <laughs> in their houses sucking on their breasts repeatedly. That's not going to you got the creator of the universe here telling you, guys, of all the things that would, you know, increase sexual tension between two people, breast sucking does the opposite. It makes you, ah, this is like my, this is like my long lost son now sucking on my breasts, breast. <laughs> what is this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's great. Uh, along the lines of what you were just talking about, it's weird because you know, we could look back in hindsight and say how obvious this is that Muhammad's desires are at least influencing his revelations, assuming that he's not actually aware of it, aware of it. Um, and you would think that his followers would be aware of this too. But this is this weird situation of, yes, if you were aware of all of this at the beginning, you'd say, oh, come on, right? But if you actually, if you can get it started, you can make it work, right? It's like, so it's like, it's like Hitler. Hitler didn't just come out and be Hitler and be, you know, taking people to the concentration camps and so on. You, you gotta, you gotta, your popularity has to increase over time. And then you get to the point where anyone who disagrees with you and says, oh, wait a minute, this is evil, you can crush them. And mm -hmm. so by the time people catch on to what's going on here. And wait a minute, this is kind of suspicious here. Every time this guy wants something, he just gets a revelation. By that time, you can't say it because he's got followers standing around with swords that'll not hesitate to chop your head off. That's exactly what uh, Albert Speer, who wrote down all the all the all his history with Hitler and uh, all the internal you know, dialogues, his his whole memories. That's what, what that's what he basically described. Where Hitler was not some strategic genius. He was not amazing. He was uh, he was just a guy who was very passionate and who was very lucky that he was at the right time, at the right place, and worked himself through passion to appealing to people's emotions to such a high level. And he surrounded himself with. Um, such yes men who would just uh you know quietly listen uh, and nod to whatever he says that he became increasingly increasingly insane and at that point nobody would stop him anymore because he because he already established it and there was no no going back there was a point of no return after building such a wall around him <laughs> it seems like people would catch it catch on over time but apparently people just keep falling for the same thing over and over again. Some yeah. dope comes along, uh, is about to do horrible things, but he uh, wins you over through basic manipulation. People fall for it, and then everyone's got to put up with it. Um, all right, let's get back to uh, Ned Flanders here. <laughs> put their desires in God's mouth. Muhammad wanted, at one point in history, Muhammad wanted to marry a girl. He had m many wives, as, as a lot of false religious leaders do. They have many wives. Um, and that's the difference between, say, Christianity and these other belief systems, because we look at even the men in the Bible who are polygamists and we say that was bad, right? But Jesus, of course, is gives us a different example. And the Bible actually teaches a, a, a different standard of one man, one woman. But a lot of these false religions, they have lots of women because it was ultimately a man pursuing his lusts in the form of religious commands. So Muhammad had a revelation thing where he, he wanted to marry uh, his son, his adopted son's wife. And as I recall... Um, what happened was they're like, well, you can't, you know, you can't do that because he's your son. That's incest of, even though he's adopted. So Muhammad came up with a new revelation. Well, God has just showed me something. God has showed me that adoption is not something he respects. Adoptions don't count anymore. There, there is no adoption. And so he, he didn't just disown his own adopted son. He abolished adoption. There are countries, Muslim influenced countries now where adoption is not allowed because Muhammad wanted to sleep with this girl who was married to his uh his adopted son uh let's pause that uh he's almost sense. Yeah. yeah the the clip is uh the clip is almost over but he had he had a couple of passages in there and it's interesting the zayed and zainab issue um in the book answering islam which was the first apologetics book i ever read still still definitely one of the best uh any of you 
you who ask me, hey, where you should get started, whether you're, you're a Christian or non-Christian, I mean, that's written from a Christian perspective, but uh, one of the best um, introductions to the issue there is, especially if you're into, uh, you know, Christian apologetics, but that was written by Norm Geisler and Abdul Salib. But Abdul Salib is an ex-Muslim, and he said that was what started bothering him about the Quran. It was the, the issue of Muhammad and Zainab. Muhammad and Zainab. Let me go ahead and uh, pull up, um, pull up Surah thirty-three, verse thirty-seven, to show what uh, Mike Winger was saying to all his fans. His fans are the Wingalings. So he starts a show like he he cut to like a middle of a of a show for this clip. But um, you know, normally it's a uh, heidly ho to all my Wingalings out there, and then he gets into a to his topics. But so this is Surah 33, verse 37 of the Quran. So uh, the, the historical background, Muhammad shows up to, Muhammad had an adopted son named Zayd. Zayd was called Zayd ibn Muhammad, Zayd, son of Muhammad. And Zayd got married to Zainab, who was Muhammad's first cousin and one of the hottest babes in all of Arabia. <laughs> One day, Muhammad shows up to Zayd's house, but Zayd isn't there. Zainab answers the door, and she's almost naked. She's got a little, uh, she got a little like nighty type thing on, and it, it blows around in the air. And it says uh, she excited, <laughs> she excited the messenger of Allah. Right, <laughs> to take that to mean whatever you will. But it's, it, the passage, this is in this is in Tabari and other sources. But then Muhammad walks away. Muhammad walks away. And it says he was uh, he was praising Allah, saying, uh, praise be to Allah who causes hearts to change. But what he had found, what he had just realized right there by seeing her when she was so hot was that Allah was going to give her to him, even though that is literally the wife of his own adopted son. But he wow, she's so beautiful, so beautiful. <laughs> I never noticed. Thank you, Allah. Yes, yeah, yeah. she's mine now, Allah. Thank you. Right. Thank so you. And then. <laughs> But then Muhammad goes away and he doesn't want to tell anyone. And he actually, and Zayd hears about it. He's like, hey, I heard you got the hots for my wife. I'll go ahead and divorce her so that you can have her. You're my prophet and my adopted father. It, you know, anything that's mine, you obviously have a right to take. And uh, people already start grumbling. Wait a minute, Muhammad's going to take the wife of his own adopted son? That's incest. Because keep, keep in mind, it's not incest in the biological sense of where you have biological danger. But back then, it was considered if you are adopting someone, you are giving him the full rank of son in your family. If you adopt a, a girl, you are, you are giving her the full rank of a daughter in your family. And so you treat them exactly as you would treat a son or a daughter. And therefore, the rules about not, uh, not taking their wives for yourself apply. But then Muhammad uh, receives this revelation. And when you said to him, to whom Allah had shown favor and to whom you had shown a favor. Keep your wife to yourself. So this is when Zayed says, no problem. If you want her, she's yours. Muhammad says, no, keep your wife to yourself and be careful of your duty to Allah. And you concealed in your soul what Allah would bring to light. So Muhammad already decided that he'd already got the revelation that Allah is telling him, hey, you need to take the wife of your own adopted son because she's so hot. Uh, and Muhammad conceals this. So Allah is actually rebuking him for concealing this. And you concealed in your soul what Allah would bring to light. And you feared men. So Muhammad did it because he feared men, not because he's actually good and moral. And Allah had a greater right that you should fear him. In other words, why do you care what men, are, what men are thinking when Allah is the one who wants you to take the wife of your own adopted son? But when Zayd had accomplished his want of her, meaning he divorced her, we gave her to you as a wife. Why? Notice, here you have the entire explanation. So the question is, why would Allah want Muhammad to take the wife of his own adopted son. Why is Allah revealing, hey, you really need to take the wife of your own adopted son. This is important. And, and Muhammad's covering it up, but Allah's saying, no, you got to do it. Hurry up. It's important. We gave her to you as a wife so that there should be no difficulty for the believers in respect of the wives of their adopted sons when they have accomplished their one of them, in other words, divorce them, and Allah's command shall be performed. Now, you see, it was completely necessary. It was a necessity. This had to happen. That's why it happened. And don't you understand? So 
notice the the absolute absurdity here, right? Because it's about to get worse. It's a, the, uh, the as insane as this sounds. It's about <laughs> to get worse. <laughs> So uh, anyway, Abdul Salib said that's what started by Surah 33, verse 37 in particular, is what started. He said he, I, he was just thinking, wait a minute, the re according to the verse, and especially the historical background, the reason that Muhammad has to take the wife of his own adopted son, Allah says it so that other believers understand that they can marry the wives of their own adopted sons. And Abdul oh, Salib, so Abdul Salib, I I remember him saying this in a lecture. He said, "I just started thinking: Is this really a moral problem that human beings deal with? Like, is this really something that there there are all these people out there and they're sitting around? What do I do? I'm so attracted to the wife of my adopted son. What do I do? And I'm really struggling with whether I should take her for myself because you know he's my adopted son." His inheritance and everything, that, that's all tied up with me. I'm the one who took him into my family. He's going to do anything I want. So if I want his wife, I can, I can say, hey, divorce your wife because she's really hot. Give her to me. And he'll do it. He'll do it out of gratitude. So, hmm, do I really do this? Do I really take the wife of my own adopted son after seeing her practically naked? And Allah, So Allah says, yes, Muhammad, you have to do this so that other men understand it's perfectly acceptable to take the wives, to take the wives of your own adopted sons. They need to know that, Muhammad. And notice, if you wanted to make that a rule, Muhammad could have just received a revelation saying it's okay. But no, this is so important. <laughs> don't you know, David, don't you know that this is such a huge problem in philosophy? It is an existential question. It is a it is its standalone branch in philosophy. Entire books have been written about it. Entire philosophers is, have specialized on the topic. Can I marry the wife of my adopted son? This is such a hugely important topic. You just can't downplay it. Um, yeah, so uh uh i mean this is absolute this is absolutely ridiculous and insane the idea that yes i mean m moral philosophers have been dealing guys just from experience how many of you have ever heard of anyone who's really struggling with this like you could a father could deal with that problem right like i mean just imagine the situation you have an adopted son you've adopted someone you show up and oopsie, you saw his his wife half naked. You're like, whoa, she is hot. <laughs> that could happen, but you're supposed to be, whoa, I am sick. I need to stop this. I need to go wash my eyes out and repent of this. Whereas Muhammad's saying, no, take her, get her for yourself. Uh huh. Allah wants it. He wanted you to do that so bad that he gave me as an example of how this is supposed to go down that you're supposed to see this, you're supposed to see a hot chick and, and you say, oh, man, even though she's my adopted son's wife, I got to have her anyway. He'll hand her over. Allah wants Muhammad to know this so much that he orders him, you have to do this and condemns him when he tries to cover it up. There, there's so much here. Like, um, I mean, oh yeah, we're not. There, there is no, there is no lying about it. It's a human thing. Like it, it, it can happen to to anybody. It could happen to me, to anyone else. You walk in, you see uh, a scene that you're not supposed to see. Uh, you, you are very impressed by it, and you think in your head, "Well, oh, okay, okay, no, um, yeah, that's very, very interesting." But I shouldn't have seen that. That's totally not okay. And yeah, I, I better find a way to get rid of this thought now. I'm going to distract myself with something else. But this is just us humans, right? It's just us regular humans. But in that case, it's Muhammad, the, the messenger of Allah, who is uh, specifically sent and chosen and guided by the almighty Allah to be, be perfect. And everybody looks up to him and he's a perfect moral example to, to everybody. He deals with this issue, not just you and me who would you know struggle and you know just get over that he deals with that issue and he's like well this is unbearable unbearable i'm going to i i have to i have to take her as, as my wife as my own wife yeah allah allah will solve this problem he, i will take her as my own wife yeah so it's it's just he was obviously not a prophet he was obviously not a prophet guided by an almighty perfect allah he was obviously not a perfect moral example that this is obviously fake. And as, as I said, and Mike Wigger already actually pointed out the verses, but it's kind of a, 
you know, he's kind of doing it rapid fire, pointing out some of these issues. But I, I mentioned that the problem gets worse. So suppose you grant everything Allah says right there, right? Suppose you just grant, okay, this is something that lots of men struggle with. They struggle with whether they should take the wives of their own adopted sons. It's just such a huge moral problem for people. And yes, they just, you know, Allah finally comes down on the side of taking the wives of your own adopted sons because, you know, they're hot. Um, and especially Muhammad has to do this. And you say, why? Why did Muhammad really need to do Why couldn't Allah have just revealed this? Why couldn't he have just said it? You don't need to. Muhammad doesn't need to do everything. Allah could just reveal something and say, don't do this or do this. And that would have been fine. Muhammad doesn't need to actually go and do everything that he's allowed to do. But it's so important to Allah. It's so absolutely important that men understand that they can take the wives of their own adopted sons, that Allah says, Muhammad, you need to do this. And he gives the explanation why. He says, so that other believers understand that they can take the wives of their own adopted sons. So that's Allah's explanation. Now, I said that this is about to get worse. It's about to get worse. It's about to get worse because Allah also abolished adoption. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is a situation that will never arise again. It's not something that applies anymore. In other words, Allah is saying, Muhammad, you, you have to take the wife of your own adopted son. Why, Allah? Why? I don't want to do, I don't want to have to uh, have sex with that super smoking hot woman that I just saw practically naked. Don't make me do that, Allah. No, you have to do it. Well, why, Allah? You have to do it so that other men understand they can take the wives of their own adopted sons. That's sick and evil, but at least you understand it. You don't understand it. When Allah abolishes adoption so that there's no, it's, a, it's not a situation that would ever apply again. You're not going to have any more adopted sons, so you're not going to have any wives of your own adopted sons anymore to ever marry. Let's go ahead and check, it, check this out. Surah 33, verse 4. Um, we've got multiple translations up here. Uh, let's go with Shakir right in the middle. Allah has not made for any man two hearts within him. Nor has he made your wives, whose backs you liken to the backs of your mothers. That's something you would say to your wife. That, uh, this was an idiom back then. If you wanted to uh, uh, tell your wife to get away from you, you said, you're like the back of my mother. Uh, meaning, I'm not gonna... I still don't understand what that means. But yeah. It's like you, you wouldn't approach your, you wouldn't sneak up behind your mom for sex. <laughs> That's actually what it is. You wouldn't, you wouldn't sneak up behind your mom and be attracted. So I'm saying, hey, you're going to be like, you're like that to me now. I'm not approaching you. I'm not. I'm not see, that, see that, 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 that's what I thought, but I didn't want to go there. In my yeah, head. I know. It's gross. It's gross to think, <laughs> but that's, appar that's apparently what it means. So, <laughs> Allah has not made for any man two hearts within him, nor has he made your wives whose backs you liken to the backs of your mothers as your mothers, nor has he made those whom you assert to be your sons, your real sons. So talking about adopted sons here, these are the words of your mouths and Allah speaks the truth and he guides the way. And then going, going down to verse five, assert their relationship to their fathers. This is more equitable with Allah. But if you do not know their fathers, this is, this is talking about adopted, uh, those who are adopted. But if you do not know their fathers, then they are your brethren in faith and your friends, and there is no blame on you concerning that in which you made a mistake, but concerning that which uh, your hearts do, uh, do on purpose. So um, the idea here is your adopted sons are not your real sons. In fact, you can see the Yusuf Ali translation, God has not made, so that's on the right. God has, God has not made for any man two hearts in his one body, nor has he made your wives whom ye divorced by Zahar, your mother's nor has he made your adopted sons your sons. He has not made your adopted sons your real sons. Such is only your manner of speech by your mouths. But God tells you the truth, and he shows you the right way. Call them by the names of their fathers, meaning their real fathers. So what this is saying, what this is saying, Allah is saying, Zayed was called Zayed bin Muhammad, Zayed son of Muhammad. Don't call him that anymore. Allah hasn't made your adopted sons your sons. Now call them by the names of their fathers. So now you call you do not adopt someone into your family so that they take your family name. Even if you can, you can take care of an orphan. You can do that. You can take care of an orphan, but you, he does not become a part of your family. He is to remain part of his family, even if he has never seen his family. You, in other words, you, you've got someone who grows up in an orphanage. Didn't happen there. 
Uh, but uh, you take someone, if you go take someone out of an orphanage, you decide to care for an orphan, fine. You call him by his family's name and you understand he is an orphan that you are caring for. He is not part of your family. And so this passage abolishes adoption in Islam. There is no adoption in Islam. So notice the problem here. Allah abolished adoption. There is no more adoption. Do you have adopted sons anymore? No, you can take care of an orphan boy. You do not adopt him. He does not become part of your family. He does not take on your family name. So given that that is the new law, is there ever a situation where a man is going to see his adopted son's beautiful wife and be attracted to her? No. So is that a situation where Allah needs to break down a rule about take, that saying that it's okay to marry the wives of your adopted sons? No, because there are no more adopted sons. What would this even be referring to? And so Allah says, Muhammad, you really, really have to take the wife of your own adopted son so that other people understand, even though that's a situation that will never rise again. It's so important that this non-existent situation requires you to take this beautiful woman and have lots of sex with her. This is so funny. Uh, it's like, uh, Muhammad, my prophet, you have to do this. This is absolutely a part of the divine plan. This must be done so that you can set an example for, for, for this situation. And later, Allah lifts that situation entirely. And Muhammad is like, so, wait, wait why, why did you make me do that? It's like, well, that was then I changed my mind. You know, that's how Allah changes his mind. Perfect. That's how he, that's how he abrogates things completely understandable makes so much sense <laughs> and it's just weird because it's like if you do not if you see this and you do not get it then like what else can you say to someone <laughs> like what else do you say to someone a, a guy muhammad saw a little six-year-old and then he gets a revelation saying hey allah is giving that six-year-old to you as your bride muhammad sees the beautiful sexy wife of his own adopted son and he has to have her and then he gets the he gets the revelations he gets the revelations saying that you can have her and this happens over and over and over again he gets caught having sex with his slave girl mary the copt mary the copt and what's uh how are his how are his wives supposed to react that he gets caught not just having sex with his slave girl. He was allowed to do that. There was no disagreement about that. Um, what are you, uh, what, how are his wives supposed to react to the idea that he got caught having sex in one of their beds, right? So Hafsa went out to run some errands. Muhammad jumps into her bed with his slave girl, rolling around in her bed with his slave girl. She gets upset. Uh, she tells Aisha, they're all upset. And what's the reaction? from his wives. They get upset and Muhammad swears. He takes an oath saying that he'll, he'll never do it again. He'll never have sex with this slave girl again. And then Allah orders him to break his oath. It's the opening two verses of Surah 66. Look up Surah 66 and, uh, and go to Sunan an Nasai and see the Hadith that gives the historical background. Um, like, what do you do when you keep seeing this over and over and over again? Any perverted thing that other people, other just Per normal, moral, basically moral people would have looked at and go, this is bad. This is evil. And Allah is just saying, Muhammad, do this. Muhammad, make sure you go back and have sex with that slave girl and violate your oath. Hey, you need to take the wife of your, your own adopted son. You, you, hey, you see that little six-year-old over there? She's yours. It's over and over and over again. And it's like, and, and notice you say, AP, let me get your perspective on this. Because we've said before that there are people who would say, even if it turned out to be true, I would not want to believe it anymore. I would not want to believe it. We've heard people like that. And we both, we both said in the past, if we actually thought it was true, we would have to follow it. Even if, it, you know, as, as despicable as we find lots of these things, if there were some slam dunk, knockdown argument that showed that Islam is true, then we would follow Islam, uh, even though we find so much of it uh, horrifying. Uh, we would yeah. still believe that it's true if there was a slam dunk, knockdown argument. But all you see are problems like this. And all the arguments that were supposed to be these slam dunk knockdown arguments are now, they're, they're acknowledging that they're false now, right? So the perfect preservation, now they call that a lie. Scientific miracles, now they call that a lie. The mathematical miracles, now they call it a lie. Everything they told us, well, here's why you should overlook these horrible things that Muhammad is doing because of this great evidence. Now they're acknowledging that the evidence is all lie. 
What's that leave you with? It leaves you with just the problems. Yeah. <sighs> All right. So what, what did you want my perspective on? You already spoke, you, you wanted to ask for my perspective and then you already spoke in my place. So, um, what should we do? Should we finish out this, uh, clip? There's only like a minute left, I think. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it justice. <laughs> All right, neighbors, we're going to wrap it on up here. <laughs> Those are things that you Let me might be able to bring Let me up. Back it up. So, so now that now that everyone is familiar with these verses, good. Check this out, because uh, I mean, he's a nerd, but nerds do their the um, nerds do. What happened was they're like, well, you can't, you know, you can't do that because he's your son. That's incest, if, even though he's adopted. So Muhammad came up with a new revelation. Well, God has just showed me something. God has showed me that adoption is not something he respects. Adoptions don't revelation. count anymore. There, there is no adoption. And so he, he didn't just disown his own adopted son. He abolished adoption. There are countries, Muslim influenced countries now where adoptions not allowed because Muhammad wanted to sleep with this girl who was married to his, uh, his adopted son. Those are things that you might be able to bring up and appeal to them to sort of realize the difference between Jesus and Muhammad. Uh, what was the other thing I was going to tell you? Um, be aware of their heart. Um, at, at the end of it, Islam is, it, it doesn't really teach that God is love the way Christianity does. And so they have a, a different view of God. They also have a view of salvation or of dealing with sins that amounts to like, are you good enough? It's not ultimately a grace based like Jesus. So you don't have the goodness of God ultimately in his love and you don't have the incredible grace of Jesus. So recognize that your friend's heart in a sense is probably crying out for those things. I feel like I feel like my answers to you is, is only like 30% helpful. So I hope there's something there that you find useful. There's a lot more. As you study it, you'll learn. So that was the advice of... Uh... <laughs> Mike Winger to his wingalings. <laughs> All the wigglings, all, all my wigglings out there. Uh, if you got to read the Quran, just make sure you pay to those, pay attention to these things. But he kind of, I mean, those are a lot of the exact same things I would point out if I were just trying to give a quick overview of some of the issues you should be paying attention for, attention to for uh, checking this out. <clears throat> um, anything else? So I just want, yeah, I just wanted to go through that book, but and and I, the main point was. Notice from that tweet talking about Muhammad and Aisha. Guys, did we look at the tweet? Did we look at that tweet? We did look at it. I'll show it again, just so, just because you obviously weren't paying attention. See this? No, I was. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know I remember it. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> Mike Winger, nicest, gentlest, nerdiest Christian pastor in the world, would never in a million years think of hurting anyone's feelings. <laughs> Nevertheless, shared a story about a six-year-old girl being married off to a 29-year-old, not nearly as creepy as what happened to Muhammad, is what Muhammad did to Aisha. Um, and not nearly as creepy because this guy, you know, this guy isn't a pattern of conduct. This 29-year-old is not a pattern of conduct. This 29-year-old this does not have authority over billions of people. So when Muhammad does it, it's much creepier. Um, but yes, Mike Winger here says, following the footsteps of Muhammad, who married Aisha when she was six, six-year-old little girl, and he was 53. Remember it now, AP? I remember, yeah. This yeah, is so, a typical example of Islamophobia. And yeah, but I remember it. Yeah. yeah uh, so anyway. Do you, is, do you also want to show how I completely destroyed and humiliated him on, on Twitter? or? Uh, I, to I actually don't have Twitter on this. I have to actually take screenshots on my laptop and pull up. But if you want to, oh, no, uh, if you want to go ahead and read it, yeah, show how you embarrass them. Because I want people to, I don't want people to look at that and think, oh, he's a nerd, so he's smart. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. He said, I don't want to, I don't want to brag about several others, He did you know? say something that caused you to go, wow, this is completely, completely insane and ridiculous. <laughs> not, and I can't believe not, that Christian apologists argue like this. Not, not really. I mean, all I did was just, uh, I retweeted, I quote tweeted something that he said, which was, let me see, what was that? Um, he said something. Oh, here, here it is. So he said, if we test Islam by the behavior of Muhammad, it fails. If we test Mormonism by the behavior of Joseph Smith, it fails. If we test Christianity by the behavior of Jesus, it proves to be the truth. Now, I, I see, I get his point. You know, I, I, I see what he what he means and where he's coming from. But I just responded to that uh, by saying, 
while I agree that Muhammad is a terrible character compared to Jesus or even the Buddha, that doesn't say anything about whether these religions are true or false. And yeah, of course. That's, yeah, I mean, unless he really fleshed out what his point there is. You know, just yeah. saying, hey, Jesus was was really good. And to be, to be fair, uh, I mean, Mike Winger is an apologist. He could give all, all sorts of things. But yeah, you'd have to flesh that out. Like, what do you mean? Like if some hey, Jesus was, you know, he I, I mean, I guess if you included that he went around like miraculously healing people, then you'd say, OK, this is this is vindicating. This is vindicating his claims because he's he's performing all these miracles and so on. But if you're just talking about, hey, he's a really good guy and he's not a scumbag like Muhammad. I mean, mm -hmm. I know nice guys. I wouldn't think they're 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 speaking the speaking the truth. But uh, yeah. So, yeah, Mike, why don't you why don't you man up and crush AP and explain exactly what you mean and how He's AP scared. is actually? He's yeah, are scared. you scared? Are you scared of him? He's scared. I would, oh. I would I would destroy him completely. How oh. about how about we arrange a fight? How about a fist fight? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't want to get into an argument because then <laughs> AP might not like me. <laughs> You know what I say, if you've hurt people's feelings about anything, you haven't followed Jesus. <laughs> I, I remember, remember how uh, Muhammad Hijab challenged each, every one of us to like a fist fight immediately after talking. Did he even to you? I think with you, it was just directly to the debate, maybe because he's scared of you. But uh, with Sam Shimon, I think he... Yeah, uh, he challenged, challenged him and Sam agreed. And then... And then, and then he was like, how about we meet for, for a fist fight? And <laughs> It's, yes, same. and he said the same thing to me as well. He wanted to. He he said he would uh, beat me up in a fist fight, which co completely random, you know. And and Sam's uh, um, <laughs> Sam's response was was pretty was pretty reasonable. It was like it was along the lines of, "Hey, I don't want to fight, but if that because Sam was challenging him to a debate, and then he said, "Well, instead of debate, let's fight." And Sam Sam's response was something along the lines of. Uh, hey, we'll we'll debate and then and then we can have a fight. He was, then they were trying to set up multiple debates, and he's like, "Okay, well, we'll we'll have a debate and then and then we'll do your fight and then and then we'll uh, and then we can do another debate and so on." And then it never it never materialized. And uh, I mean, really, I think I think I think I think Hijab has a glass jaw based on that one old man who hit him, and then he almost I mean he was like clearly stunned from a little tap. Um, <laughs> But I think he knows that. But anyway, the, the the point is the whole that whole situation is ridiculous, right? It's like the, these are your champions. These are the champions of these are the champions of Dawa. These guys. Oh, you disagree with me? Well, let me uh, insult you and threaten you. And you saw. I mean, he's still the same. Like even recently with with uh, what's her name, Pearly, Pearly something. Yeah, just pearly, just pearly, pearly things. Pearly things whatever. is her channel. But yeah, with her, watch how you talk to us, or will you will not hesitate to humiliate you, and you'll be embarrassed, like when you are being rejected by men, and blah blah blah. And it's just, uh, my goodness, these are the champions of Dawa. And so it just like it just reminds me of the, like these people are like acting like these uh, the high school bullies, who. Uh, who are of no use, who contribute uh, nothing at all to the conversation, but just uh, take pleasure in, you know, bullying people and saying dumb stuff and are then popular for a while. And then later they don't matter at all anymore. That's what it, what it reminds me of. Uh, and look at, look at the real impact it has. So you go around thumping your chest. Oh, hey, everyone's scared of me. Everyone's scared of me. Ha ha. The Quran says you can have sex with a five-year-old. That's what he says. And Ali Dawa. My daughter reached the age of puberty by the age of nine. I would tell her you are ready to be married. And then Hakikachu. And then what's, cre <laughs> what's creepy is all these dudes will again try to try to defend it. Uh, oh, Mary was a little girl and stuff like that. And what what's happening? You are ending up. You, you They are causing the nicest, nerdiest, Ikea buying, Ikea furniture buying, uh, <laughs> damaging their finger uh, from too much reading, blue blue light in the background. They're, they're, they're annoying these guys so much that they're coming out and condemning Muhammad's relationship with Aisha. That's the impact Dawa is having. The blue light thing is really ridiculous. I mean, what what kind of nerd puts blue light? You know, That's on like his, extreme on his back, nerd background. Yeah. Oh look, I have a bunch of books and I have a blue light. Uh, now you should listen to me because I have uh, yeah. uh, I have gummy bears. You want some gummy bears? 
<laughs> people always disagree with me and they say, Mike, uh, I think you're wrong about the gospel. And so I just jump right out and tell them, uh, hey, let's have a, let's have some gummy bears. Let's have some gummy bears. So by the time we've had a few handfuls of gummy bears, everything is all right. I always say that. I always say everything's better after a handful of gummy bears. And uh, so <laughs> notice, like, nicest guy in the world would never even dream about hurting anyone's feelings. And this is the guy who's now coming after Islam and exposing all the all the problems and errors. Dawa guys, my goodness, the Dawa guys, look what they're doing, creating their own enemies. Uh, Anthony here, we're, we're, we're all wrapped up with our video, so we're, we're going to be wrapping up. But uh, Anthony here says, uh, happy Father's Day to you, uh, to you, David, and um, not to AP. That's kind of dirtbaggish of you. I don't, I don't believe in fathers. <laughs> it's a Christian conspiracy. <laughs> happy Father's Day to you, David, an excellent Mike Winger impression. I do, I do an excellent uh, Mike Winger imp impression. That's just from, you know, talking to him. Um, and being able to spot when he's using an, an auto tune, something to add bass to his voice. He says, what lessons of becoming a father has taught you? It was kind of a, <laughs> kind of not the right place to go into uh, fathering lessons. But the, the main thing as far as me is that um, um, I've always been kind of like on my own and not caring much what happens to me. And all of a sudden you got a family and now all of a sudden you have a moral obligation to behave differently. And uh, in other words, uh, it's another fact. It's another, everything is another factor. Now you have multiple relationships and multiple responsibilities that uh, you can't, you don't, you know, I'm not going to be a dirtbag. But uh, I mean, if, if you'd have, if you'd have caught me, f no family, I would have no objections at all to going, flying into Saudi Arabia, preaching the gospel, getting murdered, would not care. Can't do that. Can't do that. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute, David. You should be scared. What? You should you, you, you talk so much trash. I guess who is in the chat now? Who who who? Guess who's in the chat now? Who? Mike, oh Mike wait, Winger. Mike Winger? Heidly ho! <laughs> hey Mike, give us a give us a heidly ho to all my wingalings. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Mike Winger. <laughs> Wait, no fair. You trolled me and I was with family and unable to fight. <laughs> he was unable to fight. So look, meanwhile, you got the real men sitting here drinking Bitburger. We're drinking Bitburger and making fun of nerds. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what real men do on Father's Day. <laughs> and meanwhile, Mike Winger sitting in front of your Ikea bookshelves with your blue light and your gummy bear. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Mike, look, look what I did. Look what I did reading my new ESP study Bible. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Nerd. Did you hear it? Nerd. With your, dumb, with your books. <laughs> oh, boy. I missed the whole thing. I'll have to watch it later. Uh yeah, be sure to be sure to check the chat too, Mike, because it's a uh, it's pretty hilarious. I like when I can say something and people <laughs> people take everything too seriously, and it's hilarious. Yeah. Hey, I posted like uh, early this morning. I posted a picture of Andrew Tate, and I I said, what if what if one of his webcam girl? And so so the the idea is Tate's practically naked. He's wearing these little tiny little booty shorts. These Daisy Dukes on. And he's getting these pictures of him reading the Quran in his Daisy Dukes and his booty shorts with a Quran resting firmly on his genitalia and uh, Muslims cheer for him. And I said, Ima but imagine one of his webcam girls bringing him a copy of Sahih Bukhari. <laughs> and I got all these Muslims in there. It's, it's a Sahih Bukhari, not Sahih Bukhari. <laughs> it's like, okay, guys, if you don't, if you don't understand joking, just. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, I had no idea. I had no idea. To be fair, in Muslim culture, sarcasm satire is very um they're not very familiar with it they don't really appreciate it very much they don't really get it so it's it's it, hard it's rough it reminds me of drax from guardians of the galaxy and he was saying uh quail calls him a, a thesaurus because he's using all these big words like you using salvific you're oh, using yeah. salvific and uh uh and uh quill says oh and the walking thesaurus here and Drax goes, do not ever call me a thesaurus. 
He goes, a metaphor guy. And then the raccoon says, his people don't understand metaphors. It goes right over their heads. And he goes, nothing goes over my head. My reflexes are too fast. I would catch it. But that's what these, that's what these guys, these, that's a, it's funny because you want to say Muslims are like that on Twitter and it's like, hey, I said Sahih Bugatti and they think I, I don't know it's Bukhari. But then you got me making fun of Mike Winger here. And like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you're making fun of the poor defenseless nerdiest pastor in the history of forever. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh boy. boy. All right, AP, oh, what's uh, we could go ahead and close out now. What's anything else going on? What do we got going? We're 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 still not sure what to do about all this content that we can't even cover because it's too much. I know. I, I think I feel like uh just from the stuff that we talked about earlier, I I had an idea for an interesting skit, which could be a short video um where you go to a philosophy course and everybody's you know preparing and the professor walks in and he's like I know the question on every and everyone's head. Let us get right to it. What do you do if you are attracted to your adopted son's wife? And that's how it starts. And then it goes into that. Yeah, it could I be the entire be class. Here we are, adopted son's wives, uh, 393 <laughs> the, uh, in, in the field of ethics. I actually have a bunch of skits I want to record in classrooms. So one, we got to get a classroom and we need a bunch of extras. Because I got one where I, I want, like, as far as Muslims objecting to the doctrine of the Trinity going, oh, that doesn't make sense. And then they just make fun of it. I want like a physics professor who's explaining like quantum mechanics or something to them. And they just, oh, that doesn't make sense. That's so confusing. It can't be true. And they're, they're, uh, they're laughing and joking about that. But uh, yeah, all sorts of options there. Um, let's see. What do we have? Good clan here. David and AP, I hope that I will become like you got. Don't, Impossible. Don't, don't be like us. Be like Mike Winger. <laughs> the world needs more nerds. <laughs> no, uh, good, Clint. Uh, being a nerd is actually cool now. Have you noticed that? Like when I was a kid, it was like bad to be a nerd, but now they call it like geek chic and stuff like that. It's like cool to be super nerdy. And that's probably why people like Mike Winger can, even people like Mike Winger can be popular on YouTube. Uh, cause I guess they're, I guess they're, you know, if you're drawing from the entire pop population of the world, there are nerds all around the world. And so you can find fans and then you find like the, the cool jocks who are sympathetic to the nerds. And so it, it can always happen. But he says, uh, David and AP, I hope that I will become like you guys one day showing the world how Islam is uh, false and stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, AP praying for you to become Christian. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you can you can never become like us. Uh, you you can't are, stop you can't stop people from praying for you. Oh snap! Wait, <laughs> we we are David, the best. What, David, David Wood is the evil Spock version of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, all right, everyone. So we're gonna go and wrap this up. Um, not sure when we'll be. Gosh, got a bunch of videos to cover. There's so much to cover in those. Uh, some of the recent live streams. What sucks is I know is the, the second I actually finish watching one of these four and a half hour uh, Tate interviews or something like that, there's going to be another one out and everyone's going to be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe what he said over here. And as soon as I see that, it's going to be, ah, Ali Dawa is admitting that another argument was a complete lie. That, that's that's funny. Yesterday, when I remember when I randomly brought up this one video from that uh, by that guy who was who looked like uh, Shaky Booty, and he was reviewing, <laughs> he was responding to Andrew Tate reading the Quran half naked on a, on a photo. He said something like, uh, "So apparently Andrew Tate did something again." <laughs> he started with that. He said again. I'm pretty. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he said again, and it sounds like like even they are aware now. That there is always something new that he does again a controversy where he that everyone talks about where he makes people mad or where he makes people question if you are even allowed to do that so we will never get a break as long as andrew tate is on the scene here for islam and even like for for everyone out there who's wondering what a you know what sort of uh those of you who are interested in video making this this is a gold mine of videos the tate sneeko uh matter of fact both tate brothers so Andrew posted, uh, you know, this this again, this picture of himself in booty shorts uh, reading the Quran. Uh, and he released this video where he's telling he's telling young men to go around having sex with lots of young women in order to uh, build up experience so that you can distinguish between someone you want to be a wife and someone you don't. 
he's saying all these things. God is a concept, and you know, the the concept, the concept, even if it's a total pagan god concept, it's fine. Um, all of this is uh, stuff that you know flies in the face of Islam. And there are some Muslims who respond to it. And then Tristan Tate responded to them. And he said, uh, yeah, you know, I was in jail with my brother. And he, he always kept the Quran on a top bunk, elevated above other books. So it's, it's so strange that these Muslims, he put it in quotation marks, are attacking him. These Muslims, in other words, if you're criticizing Andrew Tate for, for going against Islam, you're you're a Muslim, but in quotation marks, like not real. Isn't this amazing? This is this is Tristan Tate telling, hey, if you have any problem with all this like insanely anti-Islamic stuff he's saying, you're not a real Muslim. The only Muslims who are real Muslims are the ones who are just showering him with praise. This is awesome stuff. This is awesome stuff. Well, Andrew Tate is the is something like the the new god or the demigod of of the of Muslims right now. And they, I mean they give him the same treatment that they give the Quran all the time, right? Where they try to explain us what the Quran is actually trying to say. They give uh Andrew Tate the whole same treatment. They, they Ali Dawa did it on that video that we saw yesterday, where he tries to tell us what 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 Andrew Tate really means when he speaks of of God as a concept, or what he really means when he says there are many paths to God, and now Tristan Tate, as his brother, can also just come out there and can basically <laughs> decide who is and who is not a good Muslim. That's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome stuff. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> like he, <laughs> the Tate brothers are now the the, uh, the they get to decide who's a true Muslim and a false Muslim, based on whether you affirm or or reject Andrew Tate's claims about Islam. This is awesome. You cannot dream of a greater situation. I'm re I'm receiving a revelation right now. It says, indeed, the Muslims have abandoned Allah and have begun associating partners with Allah to men who like to get naked a lot. Uh, and Allah is the wisest and greatest. Yeah, this is the revelation. We have this comment from uh, Wingaling. Um, it says, uh, hey, David, uh, I just saw your video on that Islamic apologist saying that Jesus physically died and rose again, but that it doesn't count as dying. <laughs> Or being crucified because the angels uh, did take his soul. That is uh, indeed wild stuff, David. That is wild stuff. I'll uh, have to do some further investigation. I'm going to buy every book on the topic and put it on my beautiful bookshelf. Um, that is uh, my my <laughs> my cra my crap IKEA bookshelves, <laughs> not homemade. You see this? You see this, Mike Winger? I bought this. I bought this wood at the lumber store. Built it myself. That's how it's done. Um, and you got here a uh, deja vu. Uh, plus, plus you should get rid of, uh, of blue light. Blue light in the back is just unacceptable. That is. That is, I mean. Terrible. It's extremely effeminate. Let's just say that. Um, but no, uh, Mike, it's act that the, the crucifixion, actually an interesting topic because there you had Sheikh Imran Hussein giving his position, but there are multiple versions of that. And you would think you would think that they would be adopting that position because of the overwhelming historical evidence like you know they they they're catching on to the fact that scholars all agree that Jesus died by crucifixion and they would be saying oh okay well we have to reinterpret the quran in light of that but it's actually not it has always been a, a position in islam there's always been a minority who thought that Jesus was nailed to a cross and what the quran is saying when it says he wasn't killed and crucified, they read that in the light of other Quran verses, which say things like, when you kill someone in battle, don't say you've killed him. It's actually Allah who's killed him through you. And so it's a uh, notice, you know, you walk up, you stab someone in the battle, you stab him in the, you stab him in the throat, you kill him. Ha ha. And you walk back and you say, I killed that guy. And then the response is, no, you didn't. You didn't kill him. Allah killed him. And so they're reading it in light of passages like that or some other Quran passages. And they're saying the Quran is not actually denying Jesus uh, crucifixion. It's denying that these guys are the authors of it or that they got the victory over it or something like that. If you just read that verse, it doesn't it sounds like it is very clearly denying the crucifixion. That's why it's hard for people to uh, interpret it in any other way. What's interesting is that that's the only verse. There's like the one verse to go on that denies the crucifixion. And you've always had Muslims who interpret it differently. So it is something to take into account. One, you got to 
one best case scenario, Allah is very horrible at wording things because he confused so many people for so long. Um, but it is something that Christians need to be aware of in, in having these discussions. Uh, mm-hmm. All right, never. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All right. We'd just like to thank uh, Mike Winger for providing that video for auto tuning his voice to make him sound like he's got some bass in his voice. Um, <laughs> thank you for all the gummy bears. <laughs> <laughs> who does that <laughs> look at my $40 Walmart guitar bag there <laughs> who does that <laughs> oh man uh, anyway let, let's just say ideas about what's cool and not have changed since I was uh, since I was a boy and even are very different depending on where you go in the world all right everyone we will catch you here uh, any final thoughts AP uh, as uh, as my friend Sajid Lipham always says, stay away from Islam. So you heard it from the apostate prophet, and uh, Sajid has declared it as well. Um, you've got uh, Ali Dawa saying that the scientific argument has been debunked. You've got Yasser Qadi saying that the mathematical argument has been debunked. You've got Shabir Ali and Yasser Qadi acknowledging that there are different Qurans in different parts of the world. You've got Farid calling Sheikh Yasser Qadi a liar for ever claiming that there was only one Quran. These are great times to be in, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everyone is... What's up? And also calling Shabir Ali a punk. He called him a punk. He called him a punk. We are in the midst (laughs) of the Dawah Wars. They are breaking down because they've been telling lies. Their lies are getting called out and they are defending their lies with new lies and we've uh we've we have it's easier for us to expose lies thanks to the power of the internet than it used to be and so now we're we're destroying them faster than ever before dawa is coming crashing down uh if you want to hasten that it's very easy you do not need to learn everything you don't have to know anything you can pick a couple of things you can pick one thing you could take that tweet you could i'll show it to you you could take this tweet from mike winger something like that if you just learn if you just learn uh, the basics about Muhammad marrying a, a six-year-old when he was an old geezer, just learning that, just learning that sort of thing and share it. So, so th- those of you who have the time to learn, uh, to learn a lot of information, uh, whether it's apologetics or just criticizing Islam or whatever it has to be, um, you definitely want to definitely want to do that. But for those of you who are saying, I don't have time for this, you know, I have a lot other, a lot of other things going on in my life. If you're here, you're obviously somewhat interested in the topic. So keep in mind, you do not have to be someone who know who learns all of this stuff in order to uh, to do your part. And so if if you learn one thing and you share it with ten people, you've you've done a you've done something very valuable right there. So learn something, learn it well, share it, keep doing that. If you get a thousand people doing that, hundred thousand people doing that, million people doing that you're going to see a lot of Dawah nonsense collapse very quickly. And I ain't it. got no time. We will see you very shortly to do our parts. Catch you yeah. later. Catch you. And heidly ho, everyone. <laughs> From me, Mike Winger. Shout out to all the wingalangs. Thanks for tuning in, guys. 